Okay. Um, it was live at 8 a.m. So it's five multiple choice questions. It's nothing that scary. You just get on, you'll have 20 minutes. Usually in class, I only allow people 10 or 15 minutes for a quiz, but I tend to give a, throw a few extra minutes in for your online stuff. So don't forget to do that. It'll be open until 11.59 tonight. All right. Uh, other assignments, I kind of talked through lab stuff. Make sure you have your goggles, especially you group A people, you need to have your goggles by this week if you're coming in. Um, group B people, you have a little extra time to procure a pair of goggles, uh, but you'll need those for next week. Um, group B people, what are you supposed to do during lab time this week? Anybody? So if you're in group B, you will just take that time doing lab. I mean, it could really be any time, but if you want to sit down and use that lab time, just work on the dry lab. Okay, the dry lab is, yes, Allie in the, in the chat. The dry lab is titled Conversions, Specific Heat, and Density. And guess what we're lecturing on today? Conversions, Specific Heat, and Density. So after today, you'll have all the tools you need to approach that dry lab and work on that. Um, you don't have to finish it all in one sitting. If you do, great. And you want to turn it in early, great. But it's not due again until February 7th. Um, but we will not meet on Zoom for the group B people. I just, I haven't figured out how to split myself in two and do two things at once. I would be way more productive if I could, but I will be in the lab with the group A people. So I'm not able to host a Zoom for the group B people. So you just spend that time on your own. Or if anybody wants to volunteer to start a group me for this uh, lecture section, then um, we would love that. Okay, if you want to do that, shoot me an email. Keegan, I'll start one. There you go, Keegan. Keegan, here's what I want you to do. I want you to start the group me and send me the joining info. And then I'm going to email that joining info to everybody in this section. If you want to get on the group me, here's what they used it for in the fall. Communicating updates, um, reminders on when things are due to students. If students want to start their own like Zoom meetings and work on things as a group, that's what GroupMe was always helpful for. Um, so thank you, Keegan. Um, don't try to send them all your numbers because there's like 70 of y'all and that's just a lot for, I don't want anybody to have to put in 70 phone numbers. So uh, look for that info from me. I'll try to send that out today so that y'all can start the GroupMe for the class. Any burning questions from anybody? I think that's all the updates I have for now. Well, uh, grab your lecture slides. We are going to continue with measurements. We're about halfway through. We're going to pick up, work a few more problems, and then start some new material. Uh, we'll get as far as we can with this stuff today. And um, we're going to be working lots of problems. Here's the last bit of my sermon for the day. Um, I've been getting emails from students. I'm kind of nervous about chemistry. Chemistry is not my strong suit. I hate chemistry. I'm just kidding. Nobody's told me they hate chemistry, so don't tell me if you hate it. But if you feel like chemistry is not your strong suit, uh, I got a question in the chat. Hold on, I'll answer that in just a second. Uh, if you feel like chemistry is not your strong suit, the one, my one tip while you're doing lectures, the reason I'm having you keep your videos on, by the way, please turn your videos on for us if they're not, um, is because I want you to work problems with us in lecture as if we were sitting down in lecture together, work problems. So when I have a slide and I'm writing things out, calculating, drawing things out, please be doing that on some paper with us, okay? That is gonna help you versus just sitting back and watching me do it and be like, oh, I see how she did it, great. No, the moment you go to do it on your own, you're gonna have questions. So if you take the time, put in the time, put in the effort, do those with me here, I promise you it will pay off, okay? Uh, question, what exactly is the pre-lab assignment? I was a little confused. Great question from somebody. Um, so on certain labs, and this is kind of outlined in the syllabus. By the way, if you haven't read the syllabus, please, please, I'm begging you, go read the syllabus. Um, it'll, it'll help. But there are certain labs, wet labs, labs you come to campus for, that have a pre-lab or a post-lab with them. Sometimes they don't, but some labs do. Um, you always need to look for that. So the pre-lab assignment is kind of just to get your brain thinking about the concepts of the lab. They're questions that if we were all face to face like a normal semester, I would make you have that pre-lab assignment done the moment you step into lab and you would turn that in. 
but because we're just not in a normal semester, you do need to do the pre-lab assignment. When you open um, in Blackboard in the labs folder, there is a folder within that that says lab assignments. In the folder titled lab assignments is where your online portion of the lab should be completed. So for any given lab, whether you come to campus or whether it's a dry lab, you'll work on it, complete it, work out all the problems, get all your answers, then go to that online assignment and you will complete that online assignment. Um, and that's what you'll get for credit. A lot of the times we will do these together in a Zoom breakout room. It's just that these first two weeks we have the group A, group B format. So you're kind of doing those on your own this week. Um, the pre-lab assignment is just part of the lab procedure. I hope that answered questions. Okay, let's get into the lecture. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to send me an email and I will. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can y'all see that? Let me pull the chat up so that I can field questions as we have them. And we will get started. So let's let's remind ourselves what we did last week. Last week we started this lecture on measurements and one of the first things we did was we talked about units and why they're important, okay? Um, secondly, we talked about uh, prefixes um, we, oh, we, no, secondly, we did scientific notation. You guys remember adding, subtracting, multiplying numbers in scientific notation? Then we talked about prefixes, um, and we looked at how to start to convert between like milliliters and liters, okay? So we're going to do some more of that today in word style problem, and then we're going to move on to a few other topics. So we're going to work this problem. Work it with me. Um, I'm going to read it and then we'll just jump into it. It says this, you must transfer 0 0.000067 liters of a morphine solution into a plastic tube. How many microliters is this? Okay. Um, so we are converting between units here. What units are we converting between? Well, I see liters is the first thing given. And then the question says, we want to know how many microliters is this? So if we're going to convert between units, remember you do that with a conversion factor. It's just a relationship between the units. The way a dozen is 12 items, okay? So what's the relationship here between our units? Liters and microliters. Anybody remember? Which one's, which one's bigger, by the way, a liter or a microliter? Liter. Yes, a liter, okay? So well, we want to know how many microliters is in one liter since the liter is bigger. Anybody remember? A million? Yes, a million. So you can write in scientific notation or you can write out all the zeros if you want, 10 to the six. So now we're gonna just take our value in liters and use this relationship, convert to microliters. We wanna cancel out the units of microliters. So start with 0. 0.0000. 000 six, seven liters, right? This number makes my head hurt looking at it. So when we convert it to liter, microliters, hopefully it'd be easier to look at. So remember when you multiply by a conversion factor, I'm just gonna write my multiplication symbol and I'm gonna draw a line so that I write my factor in. I'm gonna put liters on bottom since I have liters on top right here. Now that I have it on top and bottom, those units will cancel. And the other part of this relationship goes on top. That's the 10 to the six microliter part. Okay, so now we now this is half the battles done. We, we now have to actually do the math and get the answer. We're going to do 0 0.000067 times a million. Okay, you, you can you don't have to divide by this one numerically in your calculator here because dividing by one never changes, never changes your answer. So what is how many microliters do we need? Sixty-seven, Jordan says. Come on. Okay, good. Sounds good. Everybody's getting sixty-seven microliters. Okay, sixty-seven is a way easier number to number to handle, right? So, so these values equi are equivalent. Point zero 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 six seven liters. That is equal to sixty-seven microliters. All right. Questions on that? All right, let's do some more. Um, 
Here's another problem. 26.2 mile. Any marathon runners in here? Maybe very few. Everybody's like, no, we don't run marathons. Well, props to you if you do. My husband actually ran his first marathon last year, right before COVID shut everything down. I mean, the Little Rock Marathon is like the first weekend in March. And so literally, if it would have been one weekend later, he would have done all that training and then not been able to do the race. I've, I might have laughed a little. Actually, I've been very sad. But 26.2 miles is the distance of a marathon, okay? How many kilometers in a marathon? So if you're in Europe, you would actually – you would have a, a kilometer sticker on the back of your car if you, because that's how they, they communicate and run them using kilometers. So um, we're going to convert what are our two units, miles and kilometers. So we need a relationship between miles and kilometers. Anybody know? You can actually look up at those tables earlier in this lecture slide if you have those notes with you. I think there's probably a relationship between miles and kilometers. How many miles equals how many kilometers? One mile um, is 1.60. We're just going to round 1.61. Let's use that. One mile is 1.61 kilometers. Thank you. I think it's QR. I hope I said that right. All right. So now we're going to take the distance of miles 26.2 in a marathon and convert it to kilometers. We want, uh, we want miles to cancel. Okay. So 26.2 miles. We're gonna write this in, multiply that value by our conversion factor. So miles on bottom for every one mile, it's 1.61 kilometers. So which one's bigger, a kilometer or a mile? A mile. Miles bigger, it takes over one and a half kilometers to equal just one mile. So uh, miles cancel, how many kilometers is this? Y'all got the answer? Forty-two for a second, Allie. I thought that was like forty-two thousand. Forty-two point one eight. Okay, good. Forty-two point one eight. That's enough. You can write uh, one eight two as well. It's fine. Kilometers. Okay. So in Europe, they just like to make themselves feel better and like they ran longer distances because their stickers have bigger numbers on them. I ran 40, 42 kilometers instead of twenty-six miles, but we know that's the same distance. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, let's do one more. We're going to convert milliliters to gallons. All right, milliliters to gallons. So how many milliliters are in 2.54 gallons? So you know a milliliter is very small. We actually talked about the, the, these tangible quantities last week. Gallon, everybody knows roughly how big a gallon is. Um, so there should be a lot of milliliters in a gallon, right? Especially two and a half gallons. So well, anybody have that relationship for it? And in fact, I don't know if we're going to find a relationship directly from milliliters to gallons. Maybe you could, um, but what could we do if we can't find that? What might be a, a kind of a stepping stone, a middle unit we could convert to? Liters. Liters would be a good idea. Okay, we do know how many milliliters are in a liter. And I bet it's way easier to find the relationship for how many liters are in one gallon. I bet that's easier to find. So we know that there's a thousand milliliters in a liter. Anybody know how many liters are in a gallon? I wanna say it's on that volume table of equivalents. I bet somebody has it. I really don't wanna scroll cause it makes people dizzy. Okay, Glenna said, whoa, 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 I'm getting different numbers here. 3.7, 3.785, is that? Okay, that's what we're gonna, I think that's the, yeah. 3.785, um, that's how many liters are in a gallon. So that's what we're gonna use. All right, so start with two point, we got all our relationships now, 2.54 gallons. And we're going to multiply by the first conversion factor. We want to cancel gallons. So I'm going to plug this one in first. Gallons on the bottom, liters on top. For every one gallon, it is 3.785 liters. So that means gallons cancel because you have it on top and bottom. 
And then we're going to use the second relationship between liters and milliliters to do our final multiply by our final conversion factor. For every one liter on bottom, it's going to be a thousand milliliters on top. And remember, you decide how you plug them in, what goes on top, what goes on bottom, based on what you need to cancel, okay? So now we're going to do the math, all right? Leaders cancel. So 2.54, do that times 3.785, and then times 1,000. And how many milliliters do we get? Austin says, Hunter says... 9,613.9, okay, 9,613.9 milliliters. Yeah, so quite, quite a few milliliters in two and a half gallons. All right, so hopefully you are becoming more familiar and comfortable with making these types of conversions, okay, between units. I consider this kind of stuff to be level one stuff, all right? Um, so you'll have some simple conversions on like your first exam, but what we're going to end with today is more complex than this. All right. We're going to be dealing with multiple different kinds of units. We're, these are one or two step problems. We'll be doing three or four step problems, maybe more. And uh, so that's where we're headed, just so you know. But don't freak out. The more you practice these kinds of problems and word problems, uh, the more comfortable you're going to So this was a recap that I wanted to get to last week, but really quick. This is the first half of the lecture done. So let's, let's kind of review what we learned. We learned that numbers without units are meaningless, okay? Please always, always put units. We also learned how to write and manipulate numbers in scientific notation. Uh, we also learned about prefixes and their relationship to the base unit. Now, anybody remember which prefixes did I encourage you to spend the time memorizing so that exam day um, things go quicker for you and it's less stressful? Which ones did I say would be a good idea to memorize? Not all of them, there are like four. Kilo, centi, milli, and micro. Kilo, centi, milli, that's exactly right, micro. Okay, so work on those four if you don't already have that done. Okay, so we're going to put a pin in that. We'll, we'll build off of that, but we're going to switch gears for a second. Remember the very first video lecture, we talked about matter, okay? We said chemistry is the study of matter. There's different properties we can measure when it comes to matter, and, and we listed a bunch, okay? Measure length, um, we can measure the mass, we can measure... Uh, volume, and we can measure temperature. Temperature is another property that we frequently deal with um, in the health sciences. So we have three temperature scales, and don't ask me why temperature is so complicated, why there are so many different scales for temperature. Um, you're probably familiar with two of these, and maybe you've heard of the third if you've had a chemistry class before. Uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius, we're familiar with, right? Kelvin is really used a lot in research. It is used in medicine too. If you read journal articles, you'll see publications with, uh, they communicate temperature in Kelvin. Um, but on this figure here, we have a lot of different things marked off on these three temperature scales. So I'm gonna point out a couple of things. The first thing I'm gonna point out is where water freezes on all of these. Okay, so for Fahrenheit, uh, 32, we know that. Celsius freezes at zero. Kelvin is kind of bizarre, 273, and it's actually very specific, 0.15. Never ever forget the 0.15, that's important. All right, so that's where water freezes. Another thing I'm gonna point out is where water boils. Okay, so you've got 212 degrees Fahrenheit is where water boils, 100 degrees Celsius, and 373.15 on Kelvin scale. Uh, I wanna look at the differences on these numbers. So. Just mathematically, let's calculate. What is the difference on the Fahrenheit scale between 32 and 212? This is the difference of how much? Hundred and eighty. Thank you, Daniel. That's a hundred and eighty degrees Fahrenheit difference. Okay. What about Celsius? The difference here is is different. It's not one hundred and eighty degrees. It's probably you don't even have to calculate. It's just 100, right? Zero to 100, so yeah. Okay, um, so first off, which 
unit is larger. This is a bizarre, you probably never thought this. Is a, Celsius, a degree Celsius bigger or a degree Fahrenheit bigger? Okay. What do you think? Which one's bigger? Celsius. Celsius is bigger. Okay, here's why. You have to travel 180 degrees Fahrenheit to get to the same spot um, in the Fahrenheit scale while you'll have to ha travel 100 degrees Celsius, okay? So Celsius units are bigger. Now let's look at the Kelvin scale. The difference between where water freezes and boils is 273.15 to 373.15. Guess what? That's a difference of 102. So one thing we learned here is that a degree Celsius is actually the same size as a Kelvin unit, okay? If you go up one Celsius, you're, it's equivalent to going up one Kelvin and, and down as well. Um, but Fahrenheit is smaller, okay? So what I'm about to show you uh, and how we convert between temperatures, because there's gonna be times that you have to, I have this true story. There's one time uh, our daughter had just like a little virus, it, nothing to do with COVID, um, but we have this forehead thermometer and I, it was literally like 2 a.m. guys. So I'm like half awake, but I'm trying to get her temperature and this stupid thermometer was only in Celsius, okay? It was all, I was stuck on Celsius. I, for the life of me, I could not figure out how to get it back to Fahrenheit. And so I literally took her Celsius temperature and then I used this equation I'm about to show you, 2 a.m. to convert it to Celsius or to convert it to Fahrenheit um, so I can make a good judgment on where her fever was. Is that not funny? Um, it was not funny in the moment actually, but it did happen. So there are times you need to do these things, okay? Um, so I'm going to show you how to convert between the different temperatures, all right? Some of them are very straightforward. Um, you can see from these equations, Fahrenheit to Celsius conversions are a little more complex. Uh, one thing I want to point out before we jump into these equations is that if you notice for Celsius and Fahrenheit, what's appropriate is this degree symbol. The unit is a degree Celsius or a degree Fahrenheit. For Kelvin though, it's, there's no degree. So saying a degree Kelvin is actually inappropriate. You just say a Kelvin. All right, so if we're going to convert between um, temperatures, how do we do that? Well, I will also tell you, we have no direct way to convert from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. We have ways to convert from Kelvin to Celsius and back and forth between Kelvin and Celsius. And then we have ways to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius, but we don't have direct ways to convert between Kelvin and Fahrenheit, okay? So um, Celsius is always the middleman. We'll always be converting to Celsius first if you're dealing with Kelvin or Fahrenheit. So if we have a Celsius temperature and I ask you, what is the equivalent in Kelvin? Here's how you do that. You're going to plug in your Celsius temperature, all right, and you're going to add 273.15. And you will get the temperature. You can probably prove that to yourself right now. I'm going to scroll back up. Okay, if you plug in zero, Right, what's the Kelvin equivalent? Well, we already saw on this figure 273.15 for where water freezes, okay? So that one's very simple. So this, I would not give you on an exam. I would expect you to memorize or know it or have it in your notes. Um, these, these equations beneath, I will give you on like, I give it, I provide a resources page for each exam. It's just a page I put on Blackboard that's available to you. It's got like a really good periodic table um, and then equations I think are essential for the exam. So I would put, um, these, these equations down here on the resources page, but these top two, I would want you to really have memorized. Um, I'm not going to give them on the resources page. All right, what if you have a Kelvin temperature and you want the Celsius equivalent? You plug in your Kelvin temperature and you subtract 273.15 and you get the Celsius. All right, so just simple addition or subtraction is how you convert between these two. All right, let's look at the bottom equations. Um, these are for converting from Fahrenheit and Celsius back and forth. So the first one is if you have a Celsius temperature and you want to calculate what is the Fahrenheit temperature. So looking at this equation, where do we plug our Celsius temperature in? Okay, there's lots of numbers and letters here. Some of these letters are just units and some of one of these is actually a placeholder for where you plug the Celsius temperature in and that's right here. Okay, the rest of these that I'm underlining are just units that are attached to the number that they follow. Okay, so do not also try to plug your Celsius temperature in here. I've seen students do that. You just plug it into the equation one time. 
All right, so what does this equation tell us? The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply our temperature, Celsius temperature by this fraction, nine fifths, okay? And notice what happens to the Celsius units when you do that, they cancel, right? Then lastly, you're gonna add 32 and you get the temperature in Fahrenheit. Now, where the heck does this nine fifth uh, fraction come from? I'm gonna show you real quick. Let me scroll up. Notice we had these differences up here, 100 and 180. So if we write them Fahrenheit on top, Celsius on bottom, like it's written right here. That was the difference between water freezing and water boiling. Now, if you simplify this difference, okay, first it simplifies to 18 over 10. And then if you divide both of those by two, it further simplifies to guess what, nine fifths. That's where the fraction comes from, okay? Nothing magical about it. All right, secondly, so, so that's Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now, if we have a Fahrenheit temperature and we wanna calculate it in Celsius, we're gonna use the equation on the right. So right here in the parentheses is where you plug in. Oops. Okay. And then the first thing you do, um, denoted by parentheses, which by the way, everybody remember order of operations when it comes to math? Remember that alliteration they taught you? There's different ones. Some of you, it was like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Some of you, it was PEDMAS, yeah. Or P-E-M-D-A-S, I didn't learn that one. Um, whichever one is, reminds you what to do. You always have to do things in parentheses first, okay? The P stands for parentheses. So this is how people mess these temperature conversion problems up. And sometimes these problems are worth like eight points or more on an exam. So don't mess them up. You have to do what's in parentheses first. And notice that's different depending on what equation you're talking about. Equation on the left, we're multiplying first. Equation on the right, you're subtracting first, okay? Then you multiply. Notice here you have the reciprocal of the other fraction. You have five over nine. And this is for units purposes, okay? Because you're going to end up with degree Fahrenheit after you do the subtraction. And when you multiply by this fraction, the, that degree Fahrenheit cancels and you're left with Celsius, which is what you're trying to calculate, okay? So it's for a reason. Just pay attention to the order of operations when you plug this stuff into your calculator. Okay, question so far? We're going to do a practice problem. Um, yes, I have a question. Yes, what's um, up? I was wondering, uh, on the fraction, the nine over five, instead, could we do like 1.8 in the in using it? Uh -huh. You can, some people, yeah, some people do that. Let me s share what, um, I can't see who's asking the question, but um, nine fifths, if you plug that in, in decimal form, it's 1.8, okay? So you could just multiply by 1.8. Um, but just for units purposes, make sure you know what you're doing when you do that, okay? Now, you cannot plug in 1.8 over here, right? Because 5 divided by 9 is not 1.8. But you can use the decimal form of the fraction if you want. Okay, any other questions on that? Great question. Okay, good deal. All right, let's continue. Let's work a problem. Okay, we have body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What is body temperature in Celsius and Kelvin? Okay, so uh, the first thing we're going to do, because we cannot di di uh, convert directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, we're first going to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So which equation do we need? We're converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So do we need the equation on the left or the right? The left. The right. Uh-oh, difference of opinion. We need the one on the right, okay? This is where you plug in your Fahrenheit temperature, which is what the problem gives us. So, okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're getting it in degrees Celsius. Write the equation out, five ninths. And we're gonna multiply that by what's in in the parentheses. And here's where we plug in 98.6, our Fahrenheit temperature. And we are gonna subtract off uh, not two, 32. Okay. So 98.6 minus 32 first, then multiply that by five over nine. And let me know what y'all get. Okay. 
37, 37, 37. Okay, so that is equal to 37 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's half the question. Now we're going to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. This one's really quick. All we do is we take up, we want it in Kelvin. Kelvin equals our Celsius temperature, 37. Plus, we're going to add 273. Do not forget the 0.15. And Allie and Matt both got 310.15 Kelvin. Perfect. All right, that's temperature conversions. Okay. Questions on those? I'll definitely give you a temperature conversion problem on exam one. All right, if there's no questions on temperature, we're going to move on to specific heat, but I'm going to intro this property um, talking about energy, okay, because specific heat is dependent on energy. And I think this is very appropriate following our conversation on temperature because energy um, is cha like changes in, in temperature are due to an increase in input or withdrawal of energy, okay, because heat is a form of energy. Okay, there's lots of different forms of energy. Heat is a main form. So what is energy, by the way? It is the ability to do work or supply, supply heat. The ability to do work or to supply heat, okay? Um, with energy, there are different units, okay? You have multiple units, just like for temperature, there's multiple units for energy as well. Um, this is one of the reasons people find chemistry so complex because there's just so many different units for everything. But um, the joule is the SI unit. All right. Remember, we have international units. That's the joule. We abbreviate it J. The calories more so used in like medicine. Um, this is a lower KC calorie. By the way, especially you dietetics people will probably remember or know um, there is a capital C calorie and that's what you actually read on nutrition labels. Okay. Um, what is the relationship between a lowercase c calorie and a capital C calorie? It's actually right here. Um, a thousand lowercase c calories equals one capital C calorie. A capital C calorie in my language is a kilo calorie. Okay. Now, going back to our units for energy, what uh, is the relationship between a joule and a calorie? Well, I have that right here. One calorie is 4.184 joules. And there will be times you have to convert between joules and calories. So you will want to know this relationship. Um, these other two relationships over here on the, on the far right are just relating things with prefixes kilo, okay? If, um, for, for joules, a thousand joules is one kilo joule. Okay, a thousand base unit anything is one, one kilo anything. Um, and then same for the relationship between calories and joules. Well, if I have kilo calories and kilo joules, it's the same numerical relationship. One kilo calories, 4.184 kilo joules. All right. Um, now that we've talked about energy, what is specific heat and why is it important? Well, it is the amount of energy or heat, because heat is a form of energy, that is required to raise the temperature of one gram of any substance by one degree Celsius. Okay, that probably is really confusing. I'm gonna read it again. It is the amount of energy, so specific heat is an amount of energies in the form of heat that's required to raise the temperature of one gram of any substance by one degree Celsius. Now, someone remind me, when we're talking about a gram here, is a gram a lot or a little? How do we know? We talked about tangible amounts last week. What example did we give for how much a gram weighs? About a dollar, thank you, Bianca. Okay, so a gram is very little. And so we're not dealing with big quantities of substances here. Um, we're just looking at about a gram. Now, how can we appreciate this? Let me put it to you in other words, okay? Because this definition can be a little confusing sometimes. It's, um, it, it's essentially the specific heat of substances tells you how quickly certain substances heat up or cool down. That's what specific heat really is useful for, okay? Um, I'm gonna illustrate this to you by looking at this table. We'll get to this equation in a minute, 
Um, but let's look at this table. It has different substances and then it gives you their specific heat. Um, the first column of numbers is with units of calories. The second column of numbers is with units of joules, all right? So don't be confused by that. Um, these are the same value, just different units. Uh, okay, looking at this, which substance on here has the highest specific heat on this table? Water. Water, okay, down here at the bottom. Um, I'm about to help you appreciate specific heat right now. So let's talk about the human body for an example. Um, well, actually I'm gonna do that in a second. Looking at these values for water, I'm just gonna take this first one. What this means is that we have to invest one calorie of energy per gram of water to heat it up by one degree Celsius, okay? That's what that number means. We have to invest one calorie worth of energy to a gram of water to heat it up one degree Celsius. Now, um, water, what this means, because water has the highest specific heat, is it the easiest or the hardest to heat up? Does it heat up of all these substances here? So let's specifically just compare it to ethanol. Does water heat up more quickly or less quickly than say ethanol? If I had a pot of water on the stove and a pot of ethanol and I'm turning the burners on, which one is gonna boil faster? I'm asking like, a, but yes, correct. Water will heat up less quickly, okay? Ethanol would essentially boil first because its specific heat is about half of water, okay? So let's apply this to the human body. Um, what percentage of the human body, does anybody know, is water? Like 72 or something like that. Yeah, right around 70. So a good amount, right, of our body is water. Now let's think about changing temperatures. We all live in different environmental conditions. I mean, most of you are probably in or around Conway, so probably about the same for us. Um, but people all over the world live in different environmental conditions, and we cannot control these, right? We can't control what the temperature is every day. So someone who lives in Alaska versus Panama, they're going to have wildly different environmental temperatures. So if our body was is one uh, is seventy percent water and water has a high specific heat, we can appreciate that because it takes a lot of energy to heat up water. And what that means is that our body temperature is not fluctuating based on the environmental conditions we live in. Okay, what if our body was seventy percent ethanol? Okay, because ethanol has a lower specific heat, your body temperature would actually fluctuate quite a bit more because it takes less energy to heat up or cool down ethanol than it does water, okay? So that's one way you can appreciate specific heat and what it does for you. Um, now look at these, these substances in the middle here, gold, iron, mercury, sodium. What kind of substances are these? They are elements, okay? Um, specifically, what kind of elements? Like, what are they? Are they gases? Are they liquids? Are they metals? Yes, they're all metals, okay? And if you look at their specific heats, you notice they're all super low. And you actually already know this, okay? Metals conduct, um, most metals conduct electricity. They heat up really quickly, okay? That's why we use metals for like um, skillets and pots and things when we're cooking food, because they heat up very quickly. Um, I, I forgot this one time. It's one reason too, you don't put metal in the microwave, right? Um, I had, a, I learned a hard lesson with that though. Um, I'll share it really quick because it'll help maybe you remember specific heat. I, my mom always cooked growing up. So I love to cook. I love to bake. We had plastic, you could call them kid proof, child proof, uh, measuring cups when we would cook. Okay. So we would always use plastic set of measuring spoons and things when I was cooking. Uh, for one year for Christmas, I thought it'd be really fun to ask for Joanna Gaines' new metal set of measuring cups, all right? They were really pretty, and so I got this new metal set of measuring cups, and I go to make my first batch of cookies. My whole life, I have melted butter in the microwave in a plastic measuring cup. You guys know where I'm going with this? I pop butter in my metal measuring cup and throw it in the microwave, just programmed, not thinking. And I heated it for a whole minute and then I grabbed it. And then I probably yelled some words that I would not want my two-year-old repeating. Um, so don't put metal in the microwave because it has a very high specific heat. And I just forgot that, okay? All right, let's talk about um, this equation. And we're actually gonna work a problem with this. Now, before I introduce this equation and work this problem, I'm gonna remind you of a few principles of algebra because what we're about to do requires algebra. 
So if I, if we're going to do some algebra and I have an equation, A equals B times C, and I ask you, solve for B, what do you need to do? You need to isolate B, okay? How do we do that? Divide by C on both sides. Yes, you, and, and some people will say, they use this word cross divide. Okay, so we're gonna do cross division on both sides, divide by C. Now we rewrite the equation, we have A divided by C equals B, okay? What we just did, we're gonna do similar things. You can also do cross division, okay? If I had, um, now if I say resolve for A, you would cross divide, or sorry, cross multiply by C on both sides to, to re-isolate A, okay? That's principles of algebra. Remind yourself of that. We're literally gonna do the same thing. It's just gonna seem more complicated because we have new letters, all right? But don't let it be more complicated in your mind. It's this simple. So I'm gonna rewrite this equation for specific heat. Here's the equation. It is our energy term, calories or joules, divided by grams, times the change in temperature, okay? Change, this is change in temp, not a static temperature. So I'm gonna abbreviate it. Specific key, I'm gonna call SH. Um, in our problem here, let's read the problem. It says, how many joules are required to raise the temperature of 132 grams of ethanol by 10 degrees Celsius? So we're looking for joules. So I'm gonna write, I'm gonna cross out calories for a second because we don't want calories in this problem. We just want joules. I'm gonna abbreviate joules as J. Beneath that, I'm gonna abbreviate grams, G times degrees Celsius, okay? So we literally have a very similar equation to the ABC thing I just wrote, just with different letters. So the question says, how many joules are required? So we wanna solve for J. So everybody take a second, isolate J. The only difference here is you're having to move more than one variable. You're gonna to have to move grams and change in temperature. You can do that all in one step if you want. You don't have to do it in separate steps. I'm gonna do it all in one step. I'm gonna multiply, I'm gonna put parentheses around this whole thing and I'm gonna multiply both sides of my equation, cross multiply by grams and change in temperature. I cross multiplied both sides now, I can cancel that out on the right side. Okay, now let's rewrite our new equation. Grams times change in temperature times specific heat equals joules. Now we have an equation, we're ready to go. Okay, my best advice to you on problems like this, specific heat problems, um, other problems down the road where you have equations is first isolate the variable that the question's asking for. Then plug all your numbers and units in and get your answer. Now it's just a, you probably heard this term, plug and chug, okay? Um, we're going to plug our gram degree Celsius and specific heat in if we have it. Sometimes you have to do extra steps to get one of those variables first, but I think we have everything. Do we have grams? Okay, 132, yes we do. So I'm just gonna come over here. It's gonna be 132 grams times, do we have change in temperature? The problem says how many joules are required to raise the temp, so that implies a change, by 10 degrees Celsius. So we're gonna plug in times 10 degrees Celsius. There may be times in a problem, especially on that dry lab, you read the initial temperature was 10 degrees Celsius. The final temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. And so you have to take those two numbers and calculate your own change in temperature, which by the way, the change in temperature, you always do it as an absolute value. So if you ever have to calculate that, even if it says the temperature lowers, you're always gonna plug in, this should always be a positive number, a positive value, okay? Never plug in a never negative temperature, okay? Then you're gonna multiply by the specific heat. Do we have the specific heat? Well, it depends what our substance is, it's for ethanol. You go back up to this table right here, do we have the specific heat for ethanol? In joules, which one do we need? If we want joules, do we need that 0.59 or 2.5? 2.5. Yep, 2.5, thank you. So 2.5 and then here's where some of you are just gonna fall off the wagon. 
you're going to just not write any units, okay? Please write all the units that are necessary. It's joules per gram degree Celsius on the bottom. And I really, really strongly encourage you to write it as a fraction like this and not like this. Don't do that, okay? Writing it below, like I've written, is going to help you to see what units cancel because we have grams on top, grams on bottom. Grand, uh, degree Celsius on top, degree Celsius on bottom. So now you go through, cancel your units. What are we left with? We're just left with joules. Now we can do the math. 132 times 10 times 2.5. That's going to tell us how many joules are needed to raise. And then Haley says 3,300. Okay. How scary was that? You still alive? Okay, good. So this is an example. Let's dream for a second. How might I change up the problem? How, what are some different ways you could face a same concept, same problem on specific key, same equation, but things might be different? What if I ask you to solve for the mass? What if I said how many grams of copper or gold or whatever um, could you could you uh, raise the specific heat by? You know, if I gave you the temperature and gave you the amount of energy that you're going to invest, could you solve for the mass of that substance? Okay, that would just be solving for this portion. So you just rearrange your equation to solve for that. What if I had you solve for specific heat? If I said, here's your energy, here's your mass, and here's your change in temperature, then you don't even have to rearrange the equation, okay? Um, so just know, I'll, I could ask you to solve for any one of these portions of the equation. There's four parts, any one of the four. Sometimes you might have to calculate your own change in temperature as well, um, but then you just plug that in. And it's essentially the same concept, just different portions of algebra that you might have to put into play. Any questions on that? Okay, great. That's specific heat. Let's move on to density. And after density, we'll spend the rest of our time working a few complex conversion problems. All right, density is another property. Every substance has a specific heat. Every substance has a density. So what is density? It is a mass per unit volume, okay? Units for density I've listed right over here because the unit for mass is the gram, is the base unit. We've got G over ML, milliliter. Remember though, one milliliter is equal to a cubic centimeter. And sometimes depending on what kind of substance you're talking about, um, you might have gram per cubic centimeter, but don't be weirded out by that. One milliliter is one cubic centimeter. All right, if I, if we're looking at this picture right here with the two cylinders, um, and I ask you this question, which one is more dense? What would you say? The one on the right or the one on the left? All right, everybody's saying the one on the right, and that's correct, okay? If I took, let's just say we take the bottom left corner, an equal volume on both sides, pretend those squares are equal you know the one on the right is more dense because it's got more mass per unit volume, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, this table down here shows you different substances, specifically gases, different gases, liquids, and solids, and then it gives you their density. And I just want to point out, keep note, some common sense stuff may tell you, if I gave you four different substances, one gas, one solid, one liquid, one something else and I said which one has the highest density or which one has the lowest density you don't even have to calculate anything or really even compare numbers you could say well the gas is going to have the lowest density right gases if you look at their numbers tend to always have the lowest density why is that because gas molecules tend to spread out okay we drew pictures of these I think in our very first video lecture um, gas particles always fill the space that they're allowed to fill okay um, therefore, they have the lowest mass per volume and the lowest densities. Solids are more dense, okay? The molecules are crammed together. So per unit volume, there's more mass or more matter, um, and they have a higher density. All right, uh, two other things I want you to know about density. Density is temperature dependent. What does that mean? Uh, that means density can change with temperature, 
okay? Because as you increase or decrease temperature, you can change a substance from a solid to a liquid to a gas, right? For example, you've probably run into this before. If anybody's ever had a bottle of water that was like lukewarm or um, a Coke or like a, a um, sparkling water or something, and you throw it in the freezer to cool it down, and what happens every time you forget about it, right? Um, what happens to that container of liquid if left in the freezer closed? It explodes. Why does it, why does it do that? Anybody know this is actually a density thing? What is, what is changing, okay? Um, expanding molecules, yes, that's right. So if you have water as a liquid, look at its density, it's one. But as ice, as a solid, it, the density, I know it's not majorly different, but it's slightly different, it's, it's lower. Why is that? Well, water molecules, when they freeze, they expand. So you've got a larger volume, but the, you've got the same amount of mass of water, okay? So the density drops and the expansion of those molecules is what breaks the container, okay? All right, um, density can also be treated as a conversion factor. We're actually gonna do some problems in just a second where we use density to convert. Between what? What can we convert between? You should already be able to answer this question just from looking at the units. We can always convert between the mass and between the volume, between grams and milliliters, okay? All right, just a couple of conception checks. I just want to conceptually make sure you kind of are tracking with me. So I'm going to ask, these questions are kind of silly, but I think they get the point across. Do you have a liter of feathers and a liter of bricks? So what I'm trying to say, you have the same volume of feathers and bricks. Which one is more dense, the feathers or the bricks? Bricks, everybody's saying bricks, okay? Um, so what you just told me, is that at constant volume, as mass increases, density increases, okay? The bricks are, they have more mass, therefore they're more dense. So at constant volume, we had a liter of both. The more mass you have, the more density you have. All right, um, okay, the question has changed now. Which one is the least dense? We have a kilogram of flour, a kilogram of rice, a kilogram of coins. Have the same mass, but notice their volumes are different. All right, and I'm asking which one is the least dense? Which one have the lowest density? What do y'all think? Mostly I'm seeing flour in the chat, okay? Yeah, the flour will have the lowest density. Okay, so what you just told me is at constant, um, constant mass, as volume increases, which is this direction, density does what? Density decreases. Okay, any questions on these trends? Okay, I'll call these density trends. All right, um, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna use density as a conversion factor. We'll work two problems with density and we'll convert between either volume, um, starting with volume or starting with mass, we'll convert to the other unit. So let's read this problem. It says you need 25 grams of rubbing alcohol. What volume of rubbing alcohol should you retrieve if the density of the rubbing alcohol is 0.7855 grams per milliliter at room temperature, okay? Mm -hmm. So here's the density, and we're going to use this to convert from grams. We start off with grams, and we want to know volume. So we're just going to convert to units of milliliters. All right. So I'm going to rewrite my density, 0.7855 grams is equal to what this is saying. That's how many grams of rubbing alcohol are in one milliliter of rubbing alcohol. So now I'm gonna start with, it tells me I have 25 grams and I wanna plug in this relationship. I'm gonna multiply it as a conversion factor. I want grams to cancel. I wanna to convert to units of volume, which here is milliliters. So 
I'm gonna put 0.7855 grams on the bottom for every one milliliter on the top. So this right here, this is the density. And we're using it, we're multiplying by the density. We're using it to convert. And here's the conversion, grams cancel, milliliters don't. So how much volume would we need? 25 divided by, you can either do times one over or you can just say divided by the 0.7855. Anytime something's written on the bottom of the conversion factor, you divide by it. Anytime it's on the top, you multiply by it. Okay, so we, Kendall said 31.83 milliliters. Is that what y'all got? Anybody confirm or deny? Okay, uh, sometimes people work problems like this their own little way. They set up like a proportion or a ratio. I'm gonna show you what I frequently will see. And maybe this way, will sit better with you. Um, sometimes they'll say, okay, if it's 0 0.7855 grams for one milliliter, um, that equals 25 grams for how many milliliters? X, they'll put an X there or a question mark or something. And then they just solve for the X, okay? And you can do that. That You're essentially doing the same thing that we, we just did, you're just setting it up differently. So whichever way makes more sense to you, um, these are both valid. Questions? Okay. Uh, one more problem with density as a conversion factor. Um, this one is on human blood. So the average density of human blood is 0 0.00106 kilogram per cubic centimeter. Okay, that's really bizarre units, right? But it is a unit of mass per unit of volume, so this is a density. Now, if the average adult also has a volume of five liters of blood, what is the mass of blood in the average human body? So we know uh, when it comes to volume, humans have about five liters. We're just saying, when it, how, how much does that weigh? How much of our mass does that take up in our body? So we're gonna start with five liters. We're gonna use density to convert. The only issue here, Previous, it was all nicely set up. We could just plug density right in, but we don't have the same units, okay? I have five liters, and in my density, I don't have liters anywhere, okay? So you can do this problem a couple of ways. I know that cubic centimeters is my unit for volume here, so I could convert density so that it's kilogram per liter, and then you can just plug it in, um, or we could walk it out in different steps. And I wanna do it the way I just said it though. So let's take this density. I have um, 0 0.00106. Before we can convert liters to mass, um, we're gonna take the density and we're gonna get it in proper units. So this is kilogram per cubic centimeter. And now I wanna do some conversions on this to get it in kilogram. Essentially, I wanna say how many kilogram per liter? Okay, then if we have it like this, we can just plug it in and cancel out liters. So how do we convert from centi cubic centimeters to liters? Anybody have any ideas? Go to milliliters first. Well, we, and that's easy, right? Because we know that one cubic centimeter is one milliliter. So I'm just literally gonna erase and write this is totally valid, one milliliter. All right, we did it. Now, how do we go from milliliter to liter? Anybody know that relationship? How many milliliters are in one liter? A thousand. Yep, a thousand. Okay, so now we're just gonna take, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of come over here. Uh, it's not the right number. Now I'm gonna multiply for every thousand milliliters, that's one liter. And then milliliters will cancel and we will have a value, a, de a new density. This is gonna be our new density and it's gonna be multiplied by a thousand. So you should get 1.06 kilogram per liter. Is that what y'all got? So this is our new density. 
Now we have units of liters. Now we can just plug this in and convert directly from liters. I'm just gonna multiply five liters by our new density, use it as a conversion factor. Liters will cancel and we can calculate a mass. I didn't tell you what to use for units here. You could do grams, but we're, we're already gonna be in kilograms and that is a mass. So no sense in converting any further. So you do five times 1.06, did you get? Is that what y'all got? Okay, and the units there are kilograms. Okay, any questions on what we did? or how we use density as a conversion factor to convert from a mass to a volume or vice versa. All right, so that's pretty much it for density. We got about 15 minutes left and I'm just gonna use that time to work complex conversion problems for the rest of today. Um, anything we don't, so I'm gonna go over some tips, but then we've got about four slides, four problems. Um, anything we don't get to, I will probably on one or two of them make a video on how to do it unless we, we get to it. Um, and then I'll probably save one for the starting lecture on Thursday as kind of a refresher. So what is a complex conversion problem? It's just a conversion that requires multiple steps. And usually you're converting between multiple kinds of units. Um, and sometimes they're very unusual um, conversion factors, all right? For example, I really think this density right here, that was pretty unusual. We don't usually see units like that for density. So just an example. Um, here's some tips as you go about these, all right? Um, do all the conversions in one problem, okay? I like to line mine up, like start with your initial number and then multiply it by conversion factor number one, multiply it by conversion factor number two. And if you, how many, how, I don't know how many you have, but depending on how many you, you have to get to the units you need, you just continue it in one problem like that. Here's why I like to do this style, uh, because it shows me usually you can go right on through and you can cancel proper units and then you can see the ones that don't cancel are the ones left in your answer. Okay. Um, sometimes people on exams or different stuff back in the dinosaur days when we did paper exams, you guys remember those? Do you guys miss those? I miss those. Um, some people would start their problem and maybe step number one is right here. And then step number two is up here in this corner. And then step number three is right below it. But step number four is somewhere. And I literally have to do a scavenger hunt to grade your work, okay? And it's hard for you to follow that, I'm sure too, and recheck yourself. So um, keeping it all in line is a lot easier for everybody, I think. Um, let's look at the next tip. Uh, write down all the conversion factors given before starting the problem. So we're going to look at how to do that. You I, sometimes even just identifying what relationships you have in your problem can be hard. So we're going to look at how to do that and how to write them all down. Um, alternatively, a good place to start is usually with the first number or conversion factor given. Here's what I hear from students all the time. The hardest part of these is figuring out where to start. And they're like, once I get started, I can do it. I just don't even know where to start. So we're gonna practice, how do we identify where to even start? Sometimes, usually, but not all the time, it's with the first thing that you're given, all right? For me, I like to identify what units do I need in my answer? And then I'll put that unit on top in my very first conversion factor, okay? For me, that's a foolproof way to get the units that I want in my answer. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. And then lastly, make sure you have the desired unit on top and bottom. I kind of just hit on that, but um, always recheck your answer. Okay, let's do this first one. I like to start with this first one because it's all very relatable um, for most people. You get pulled over by a cop. Anybody been pulled over before? I was pulled over three times my first year of college. I'm serious. I did not know how to slow down, uh, but I learned the hard way. All right, you're pulled over by a cop who's going to give you a ticket for going 0 0.028 kilometers per second in a 55 mile per hour zone. Where are you speeding? And we're given some extra info, how many kilometers are in a mile, all right? So where should we start with this? First, let's identify 
The question is, where are you speeding? So how are we gonna answer that? We are given our speed in these units, kilometers and seconds, okay? But the comparison is we need, we need to convert that to the speed zone, right? The speed limit, which is miles per hour. So we have a distance of kilometers. We need to convert that to a distance of miles. We have a time of seconds. We need to convert that to a time of hours, all right? This is miles per hour. Right now, our speed looks like kilometer per second. So we just need to convert it to these units. Then we can compare and see were we higher or lower than 55. Okay, so that's the game plan. Um, we're gonna start with what, what our tips say, the first conversion factor that we're given. Um, so we're also gonna write this out as a relationship, 0 0.028 kilometer, uh, 28, not 25, in one second. Okay, we'll start there, but we have other relationships. We have um, 1.61 kilometers in one mile. Are we gonna need any other relationships? That's all the problem gives us. We won't actually plug 55 into our problem. This is just a standard that we're gonna compare to in the end, okay? But what other relationships what might we need? We have the ones to do the distance conversion. What about the time portion? Seconds to hours, okay? And different people do this different ways. Some people go seconds to minutes, minutes to hours. How can we go from seconds directly to hours? I like that because it's just one step. How many seconds are in an hour? Thank you, Haley, 3,600. Okay, so now we've got all of our relationships. So this is what I mean when I say write out all your relationships. Now start with the first one you were given. And let's actually start canceling units. So we don't want kilometers on our answer. Uh, we want miles. So I'm going to pick this second conversion factor. I'm going to write it and multiply by it so that kilometers cancel. Make sure you're on mute. I'm getting some background noise. OK, so kilometers cancel. And then we're going to plug in this last one so that seconds cancel. And take note, we have seconds initially on the bottom. So how do we need to plug this in? Put it on top. Yes, correct. Put seconds on top. So 3600 zero, zero seconds per one hour. So now seconds are on top and on bottom, so they cancel. And we're left with, look what doesn't cancel, miles on top, hours on bottom, which matches our speed limit units for speed limit. Okay, so now we just need to multiply 0 0.028 divided by, remember if it's a number on bottom, we divide by it. And if it's on top, we multiply by it. So divide by 1.61 and then multiply by 3600. What was your speed? Okay, 62.6. So the question is, and that's units of miles per hour. Were you speeding? Yes, you were. But more importantly, could you talk yourself out of that one, do you think? Some of you are like, oh yeah, easy. Come on, officer. I wasn't going 20. I was only going like 10 if you round down. Okay. Or wait, that's not even... You weren't even going that many. You're only going like seven over. Oh, that's so easy. You got that. All right, questions on what we just did? Okay, um, let's look at one more because we got six whole minutes. It's plenty of time. And anything we don't get to, I'll probably do a video on like one, one of these. I don't know which one. I'll post that to Blackboard. Um, it might be today, it might be tomorrow. Um, here's what I will encourage you though. Don't just watch me doing it. Okay. You try to work it yourself first. Then if you get stuck, go to that video. Um, it'll, it'll again, it'll be on supplemental videos folder on blackboard and then watch it as a guide. 
okay? But don't just watch and be like, oh, I see how she did that. Please try it yourself first. Okay, this problem says you have a vial of a drug solution that is 65 milligrams of drug per milliliter of solution. Your patient needs seven milligrams of the drug for every kilogram of body mass. The patient weighs 150 pounds. Here's our actual question. Here's where the question begins. How many milliliters of the drug should you administer? I like identifying where the actual question begins because quickly you can, you can determine what units do you need in your answer. And here we need units of milliliters in our answer. So, and then we're given one more piece of information uh, in that last parentheses. So let's just write down all of our relationships first. Um, and I, I tried to underline them as I went through and I encourage you to try that as well. So it's 65.0 milligrams of drug for every one milliliter of solution. You don't have to write these little descriptive words that I'm adding, but for me, it helps me with the problem. Okay, my next relationship I underline, it's seven milligrams of drug for every one kilogram of body mass. Okay. Um, we have another thing underlined, but this is not a relationship. This is just kind of a freestanding number. We will use it, but it's not related to any other. It just says the patient weighs this. Okay, so that's actually not a relationship we'll write down, but we'll, we'll use that later. Um, all right, another one, we have 2.2 pounds for every one kg. So the question is how many milliliters of the drug do you need? So the way I like to start this is I'm going to look at my relationships that I just wrote. Which one has units of milliliters in it? The 65.0. Yep, the first one. So I'm gonna take that one, I'm gonna put milliliters on top and then I'm gonna start my problem. Okay, I'm gonna write this. So here's what I mean. I'm gonna pick this first one. I'm gonna put milliliters on top. If you do this, so any given question, again, I just told you something that always troubles students. Where do I start the problem? Well, what is your question asking for? Identify what units you want in your answer. Then pick the relationship that has that unit and write it where you need it. Here we need milliliters on top. We're not trying to solve for one over milliliters. We just want milliliters, okay? So I'm gonna put milliliters on top. Now I'm gonna go about canceling any unit that I do not need in my answer, okay? So I wanna cancel milligrams. Do I have another relationship with milligrams in it that I could use to cancel milligrams? I do, right here for every seven milligrams of the drug, it's one kilogram of body mass. And milligrams cancel. Okay, uh, I don't want kilograms. I haven't canceled that yet. I don't want that in my answer. Do I have another relationship that will let me cancel kilograms? I do. So for every one kg, it's this one right here, plug that in now, 2.2 pounds. And now look at that, kilograms cancel. So now if I were to stop, I have milliliters on top, pounds on bottom. But the question is not saying how many milliliters per pound, it just is how many milliliters overall. So what can I do? I need to cancel pounds. Multiply it by the 150 pounds. Yes, thank you. Okay, I said we would come back to this. So just multiply by one. Uh oh, what happened? I don't know. Multiply it by 150 pounds and pounds. Cancel. What is our final answer? How many milliliters of drug do we need? 7.34. Notice that I didn't spend a lot of time even rereading my question. I just pull the numbers from it and you let the units guide you. Cancel any unit that you don't need or don't want in your answer as long as you have the correct unit that you put first where you want it.
for your answer. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Again, if you have other ways that make sense to you and you feel confident using those ways to solve conversion problems, this is not the only way to solve it. This is just the way that I tend to show students how I do it. Okay, so if you have another way and you get the same answer, by all means, more power to you. Um, but these are just examples. So with that, if there's any questions, I'll stick around. We're at time for today. Thanks for joining us. This lecture recording will be posted by tonight if you need to rewatch anything. Um, other than that, we'll see you guys Thursday. Don't forget your quiz. Don't forget to take your quiz today.